I'm the wrong date of birth for all this technology. All right. So my message is fairly simple. I think regenerative agriculture provides some of the best solutions to some of our planetary, human health and reef issues. And it's an exciting story. So the message is healthy landscapes, delivers healthy food fibre and healthy profits people and uh, a healthy planet and I know David will be covering some of that later. And when I'm talking about regenerative agriculture, obviously today, particularly uh, regenerative grazing which covers more acres than any, any other practices, but also the new forms of um, cropping, biological agriculture, agroforestry and, and, and a whole range of other things you can see up there. But I'm going to start with the big picture first because um, where I'm based, I'm still uh, an occasional lecturer at the Australian National University and just down the corridor are some of the uh, world leaders in um, what I call the earth system science and things like climate. And there's sort of an overwhelming consensus across the world, scientists looking at this whole issue of the systems that sustain a healthy earth, um, that we have moved into a new phase of Earth history, which they're calling the Anthropocene, human-caused um, destabilisation. So on the top left, you can see the only blue-green planets uh, that we know in the uh, solar system in the, and further out. Um, and it's blue-green because life exists on this planet, and it was actually life that created conditions for life. And that sort of grotesque picture there shows that one of those species of life, which is us, is now starting to destabilise uh, these Earth systems. And when I'm talking about Earth systems, the planet is maintained by nine interacting systems, which I'll touch on briefly. Things like climate change real. Well, I, in, 19, in 2013, I did a consultancy job for a, an aid organisation in the, what's called the dry zone in... Um, Burma, Myanmar, they had 20 years then of climate destabilisation of the monsoons coming off the Indian Ocean. And they'd had hundreds of years of this stable, grazing village economy, and they, hadn't been, they didn't know how to adjust to this huge shift. And, and so they've turned healthy, diverse grasslands into pretty much desert with just a few thorn shrubs. So if you ask them about climate change, uh, they'll, they'll say, yeah, she's pretty real. And what's really led to this shift in um, de our destabilisation of the Earth systems is what's called, uh, following the um, 1950s, they're calling it the Great Acceleration, which in involves huge takeoff in socio-economic trends, whether it's population, real GDP, foreign direct investment, and so on and so on. Very similar trajectory. And the same applies in, in the biophysical side, whether it's the amount of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide that's gone up in the atmosphere, methane, surface temperatures, the ocean acidifying because it's pulling down carbon dioxide, stuff like that. That's what they're, they're, they're saying has been the precipitation. It's really the takeoff of the global economy, economic rationalism from the 1950s and 60s on. One of the Earth systems is fresh water use, and that's the RLC, uh, Soviet cotton, the world's fourth largest lake, about the size of Tasmania. They pumped it dry. So we're a pretty good species if we set our minds to it to have a dramatic impact. And these, I'm not going to go into the details, I just want you to get the idea, but these are the nine sort of Earth systems that interact to sustain uh, what's been the last 10,000 years when agriculture and civilizations evolved. It's been a unique time, but now we're starting to push. And the evidence shows that the worst aspects of industrial agriculture is a key player in things like climate change, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and stuff. Huge loss of biodiversity. We're now in the sixth greatest extinction event ever in the history of Earth, and this time caused by us. Uh, land system change, freshwater use, and the phosphorus nitrogen cycles. <coughs> so that's the downside. 
Uh, some of the worst aspects of industrial ag is involved in that. But there's a flip side, and that's what I'm positive about, because if we have a regenerative agriculture that pulls down carbon, puts it in the soil through healthy soil biology, uh, that, that has implications for water storage. Uh, regenerative agriculture actually provides some of the best solutions, and, and that impacts on human health, which I'll touch on after lunch. So how do we get into this mess? Uh, I'll put a hyphen in the word agriculture because I'm emphasising um, our approach to how we farm land and graze land, a cultural thing. And I won't go into the background too much, but obviously we've got a, a continent here totally different to where agriculture and, and the European settlers arrived from. Um, Northwestern Europe, England, very young, 10,000 years, really young, full of nutrients after the Ice Age, melted and delivered all those nutrients. Very humid, wet climate. Uh, nothing like what we're used to. And, and conversely, some of our soils up to 3.8 billion years old, highly leached, uh, sitting underneath salt layer. Uh, and so totally different. And they brought an industrial... Uh, a, a modern uh, farming technology suited to the heavy soils and that humid atmosphere and, and uh, constantly growing plants. And um, we then hit this continent. And uh, three or four decades in places like Western Australia, take out the trees, that salt layer comes up and, and that's the result. There's now millions of acres of dry land salinity and it's still growing. And one of the stories that no one talks about it, and if you read the early settlers and surveyors stories, you know that a lot of the grasslands in Australia were spongy, that, uh, full of diversity. Spongy because they had a lot of carbon and therefore a lot of uh, moisture stored. And so we came in, and I'm thinking about my district, Southern Monero, grazing country, overgrazing, ploughing. Within a few decades, what's called a small water cycle, that's the the small water cycle that operates locally, regionally, um, and out of that you get lots of mists and fogs and early records in our area. Uh, go for a ride on a horse if you're a surveyor or an explorer. Um, even in summer, from the knees down, you're pretty wet, um, even up to lunchtime because of the mists and fogs, which is that small water cycle. And in that is transpiration with the micro particles from bacterial and other elements in plants, which are the rain seeding particles. And that was all destroyed. And there's an historical precedent we need to think about because where our agriculture, Western agriculture evolved was in what's called a fertile crescent in the Middle East. On those beautiful grasslands uh, where they domesticated basically annual weeds, which became our modern cereals. They domesticated sheep and goats first. And you had rich river valleys. And a lot of the Mediterranean was forested. And um, so they then set about destroy, destroying through overgrazing, you know, through lack of knowledge of it. And even a lot of the Mediterranean's been overcleared. So here in 360 BC, Plato's having a whinge about the eroded hills around Athens, like the skeleton of a sick man, all the fat and soft earth being wasted away. <clears throat> you now look at that area of that fertile crescent. Syria, Iraq, Libya, Iran, top end of Africa, the Sahil, Chad, all those countries. It's all turned into desert. Destroyed the small water cycle, constant droughts, and as we now know, constant social conflict. And when I travel widely across Australia, through overgrazing and cropping, we have destroyed our small water cycle to a greater or lesser extent across most of the continent. In other words, we are slowly, to different degrees, desertifying uh, our own landscapes. And it's not a story that anyone's acknowledging, but we have lost largely the small water cycle. And, uh, and through various activities, which, you know, it's smart to be, it's, it's easy to be smart in hindsight, but that's how much soil we lost in, in the big Mallee droughts. We had our own, dust bubbles. We tend only to hear about the American dust bubble. Um, we've had five events like that. 
I remember as a young student climbing in uh, New Zealand and walking on red ice, and that was the millions of tonnes of dust that had gone over in the 30s and turned all the New Zealand Alps red. Millions of tonnes went up to 4,000 k's. There's been five other similar events. The American Dust Bowl. Extraordinary rich prairies were settled in uh, the middle of the um, 19th century. Some of those prairies had up to 700 species of diversity. Then they put the plough into them, and droughts and the black, the black storms that hit New York, etc., followed. So really it's the plough and domestication of animals that's created deserts around the world. Uh, so did we get our agriculture wrong, and is it wrong for this continent? Uh, and if you look at the available land globally for agricultural use, aside from ice covered, we've already degraded 35% uh, of that land and turned it into deserts. Five million out of 14 he million hectares globally. And that trend is accelerating. That's the bad news. Um, with regenerative agriculture, I'm arguing we can now graze, crop, farm, have forestry, all the rest of it. We now know we can do it without some of the industrial chemicals that are harming soils, etc., and, and getting into human food, and without degrading, desertifying the land. It's doable. And that's partly what today is about. And uh, just through some of the regenerative stuff we're going to talk about and, and show today. And that has a huge implication on those earth systems. And I'll show you later, the best solutions to some of those planetary challenges are, reside with us, let alone human health. And, and that's an incredibly exciting story. <coughs> so, um, and that's the secret. It's a, a peasant farmer in the Ukraine, those wonderful soils there, but the secret is a healthy soil. It's as, as I sort of try to say and talk about in the book, <laughs> We're only going to change that if we learn to read our landscapes and understand how they work. And as I'll show you directly, I didn't when I started, and I, made a, I did a lot of damage because I had no literacy, no ecological literacy. I couldn't read my landscape. So the current industrial paradigm, really, we still regard nature as a bit of the enemy. Knock the hell out of her, put some inputs in. Uh, some cases leave the stock in too long, etc. I mean, that's an advertisement for Roundup. Uh, about 2010, full page ads in all the rural weeklies across Australia. Uh, white pointer at Roundup drums. These are the psychologists behind the big multinationals framing these ads. Smiley face in the Roundup drum, and if you read the words there, trust your killer instinct. So we're being encouraged to have, if you like, a, a dominant a, a approach to nature. So I guess I'm asking the question, it's, it's, I think it's just that we haven't realised that we are desertifying landscapes, but uh, are we in denial about really what's happening in front of us? And I, I suspect it's not denial, it's just that we don't know what those landscapes were like in the 1830s and 40s when those early settlers rode across them. And my own journey, was um, I had to take over a farm at 22 when my father got sick. Grown up on a farm, but it didn't mean I knew how to manage it. And so I asked the best advice and proceeded to do a lot of damage. I, I didn't, there's no RCSs teaching holistic grazing or anything like that, so I set stock uh, four or five years of the early 80s drought. We had a merino stud, decided I had to defend that, so we overstocked to hell, fed ourselves into a massive debt. And um, that photo you can see on the right, I could drive past that and not realise that landscape should have been in hospital in intensive care. It was desperately ill. And so it was coming out of that that I realised um, I was blind to my landscapes. And really, um, what I'm talking about uh, is the square foot of real estate up here. As one farmer said, it's, it's my paradigms um, that have been instilled in me through family and long tradition. I didn't realise uh, what damage I was doing. and That's a fence line on our, uh, we're treeless, that's all a lot of our country. Um, that's a fence line between two neighbours, two different paradigms. It's, it's a barbed wire fence, 
and I've straddled that fence in my chains and it's not very comfortable. So just summing up quickly, um, because I'm going to illustrate it with, uh, with uh, stories, uh, which is what, how I approach it in the book. You can simplify, and this has come from a lot of ecologists, down to five key landscape functions behind ecological literacy. Clearly the solar, everything comes from the solar, plants making sugars for the soil. Water cycle, soil mineral cycle, biodiversity. And the one we all forget about, that square foot of real estate, the paradigms and worldviews. So really I see my role as a manager is to stack on as many solar panels, photosynthetic, chloroplasts, etc., on my landscape for as long as I can to put those root sugars into the soil to stimulate the soil biology because everything flows from that. And this solar function therefore impacts all the others. And I'll just go back there. The important thing about that diagram is that if you regenerate one of those cycles, it has knock-on effects with all the others. If you really harm one of them, the same applies in reverse, so that everything is interrelated. So maximising the solar energy cycle, you can do it through the new ecological, holistic grazing, whatever you want to talk about, and David will be speaking about that later. And I'm going to touch on briefly some of the remarkable stuff happening in multi-species cover cropping, etc. That's having these tipping points effect in the soil. An example of how dramatic it can be, and this is in um, sort of like uh, New South Wales Western Division country, um, six eight inch rainfall country, one of Alan Savory's early clients. Uh, that paddock on the right, uh, when he started farming, it was all desert. Uh, he had to walk a kilometre to find a perennial. <coughs> and after um, 25, 30 years, you can see the change on the left, just through a holistic grazing, ecological grazing approach. And at the end of that 40-year period, he's now running, or he, unfortunately he's just died, this guy, but uh, his family are now running more than three times of what they uh, were running when they started. And, and those examples you can see across the uh, spectrum, and uh, just speaking to Gala and Mill, I'm coming in, uh, an RCS client, this is their country, quite dramatic. Um, you can see the arrow top left, that tree there that the arrow is pointing to is the same tree bottom right. And that's their transformation in just 10 years with, with a, a steep sided active erosion now healing. Uh, and I think, I'm talking to her last time, I think there's now eucalypt uh, seedlings now regenerating in that once active gully. This guy, Kachana family, uh, Hengler family up in um, tough country in the Kimberleys. That top photo, that was devastation due to feral donkeys and cattle. And as, uh, as they told me, the only tools they had were animal impact, human ingenuity and a solar panel to run an electric fence. And the bottom right has been the transformation just through changing that mindset to how you capture solar energy and, and stimulate the soil. This is only a few months back. We're all in drought still in the south, in, in New South Wales, and uh, the Coglins here are uh, running at least 2,000 cows in a mob. Big rotation, they've had extraordinary transformation. Obviously done quite stock handling um, to help the whole process, but uh, it's quite remarkable what's, what happens when you get animal impact and, and uh, good rest and rotations. And still driving the solar function, Pasture and cover cropping um, is when grazing, you've, you've got to combine grazing to make these things work with your cropping systems. And uh, so when you manage it properly, each benefits the other. So cover cropping is really, the, the croppers here that know better than me, that it uses a diverse annual crop, all the, uh, as the, uh, the leader of it, Gabe Brown in the States, is showing you need at least 12 or 13 species doing different things to stimulate different biology. Uh, and then you mulch that down with, with livestock uh, or some of the croppers down on the reef using machinery to lay down the cover which protects the soil and then you can direct drill into that and you get these extraordinary transformations which I'll touch on briefly. Pasture cropping evolved by Colin Sice and uh, a variant of Bruce Maynard of no-kill cropping 
is when they're drilling crops into perennial summer active C4 grasslands, which go dormant in the winter. And then you graze again, and uh, getting remarkable results both into soil stimulation and, and cropping yields. Now three million acres uh, around the world of pasture cropping. Function number two, uh, if you get that solar function working, you get healthy soil biology and ground cover, has huge impact on your water cycle. And this is uh, from the Savory group uh, in Mexico. That blue arrow in those two photos is the same point in that landscape. So previously, it was set stocked. You can imagine you've got a rain poured off that hard, compacted ground. That's why there's water there. And, and uh, 27 years later, of switching to ecological grazing, that's the result on the right. And if you get your soil, your solar system and your soil functioning properly, and you're absorbing a lot more moisture, when you get a big rain event, in this case, uh, nearly over three inches in uh, two hours, 82 mils, that rain and even heavier should go right in, whereas if it's compacted, dead soil, uh, you're losing at least half your, your, your effective rain. And in a country like ours, you can't afford for that to happen. But you're only going to get that through active ecological management. And this is where things like overgrazing and, and traditional industrial cropping down to a shallow length has uh, huge detrimental effects because that photo of roots on the right, uh, either grazing or, or uh, ecological cropping, it's the roots that go down, create the spaces for the water to get down, the healthy soil biology creates the air spaces for the water storage, uh, compared to uh, the photo on the, on the left, where traditional industrial cropping over a hard pan, you only have from annual cereals and stuff, very shallow root mass, no food for your biology, no air spaces, etc. And this is not Australia, but this is a, a photo of, of, of prairie soil in the States. Um, that Kerns is one of the species that are actually now starting to uh, make products out of a, a, a perennial grass. But the point I really wanted to make was um, in, in both Australia and the States now, from traditional cropping, you have they're finding there's a hard pan that far down, so water doesn't go through it, and it's because of the concentration of annual roots. So that soil biology is the secret. And it's all about root diversity and depth, uh, feeding the soil biology and being able to store water. And there's that hard pan I'm talking about. And so you've probably all seen this. Uh, there's a reason why um, RCS and others recommend only take half and leave half when you have a, a rotational grazing system. It's because once you get over taking more than 50%, your root die-off goes up exponentially. And that has huge impact on that poor old plant stone trying to crank up and grow again after grazing or a bit of rain. So there's a good reason for the 50% take. If you get all this right, the evidence now, both here and in, in, in the States, shows that it, just by putting 1% more carbon in the soil, and uh, people in Australia are now doing that within uh, eight, nine years of, of ecological management, or even faster, 1% more carbon in your soil uh, means that you can store, uh, some of the research shows, over an extra 140,000 litres per hectare of water. So you're starting to drought-proof yourself. And if we're talking about the water cycle, uh, this is just an, uh, there's other ways of going about it. We know Peter Andrews' work, Yeoman's Key Line, and this is a, a neighbour of mine, beautiful 8,000 acre basalt country, um, until he got his grazing right. So he's just made some homemade, what Peter Andrews would call leaky weirs. And the result now is, and you know, he's used old cattle yard posts, God knows what, just to slow down the water and, and get it to rise, and now he's got nine pools with platypus return, he can graze the fenced off country, and uh, his country's rehydrating just through some simple muck around tools. <coughs> this is the big one of course, the soil mineral cycle. Uh, and it's very simple really, 
An effective soil mineral cycle means a biologically active living soil. It's all those bugs underneath that start to create uh, the carbon and the air pockets uh, that leads to transformation. And so it's all these bugs under the ground that require plants for food, uh, the sugars and, and uh, dying off root material, etc. And the natural world is composed of this co-evolved interdependent group and 93% of the non-plant organisms we can't see, they're, micro, they're microbes. And so the plants feed them and uh, in return, if you think about a, a root fungus, they get the sugars, their part of the bargain is to go off and source the huge a range of nutrients in that soil. So it's a symbiotic relationship. And really what we should be trying to aim for is a bit of an iceberg look about our soils. We should have six to nine times more life under the ground than our livestock walking on that hectare above. Seems a radical thought, but the best soils and operators are getting to that degree. And this reminds me very much of my early management. I'd go and put in a paddock of oats, um, good dose of superphosphate, put on um, steers to finish or uh, pregnant ewes, and within a month or so they'd start to scour and then they'd start to do that and I'd say, what are those silly bastards up to? Um, animals have wisdom to detect a range of nutrients. That superphosphate in that monoculture wasn't delivering it because there was no soil life. And that dead uh, weed, which had concentrated nutrients, um, the silly bastard in this case was me, not the, uh, not the cow. And that's what's happened. We've um, exported our nutrients uh, uh, across a lot of Australia and um, you know, I'm sick of the All Blacks pumping us every year and uh, we're giving them our nutrients. We don't need to give them any. But it's not just historical. In 2011 I was driving across the head of the Liverpool Plains. Dry season. Eight mils of rain the night before. And this is 12 hours later and I just stopped. Hopped over the fence, went for a walk. That soil had been so overplowed, so over fertilised, so much chemical, had a big crust on it and it was just dead. And uh, eight mils of rain, that should have gone in within 10 minutes. And it's lying there 12 hours later. And, and so the, these are one of the critters, one of the organisms that are crucial, the root fungus, the mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, they've got these microtubes. And in a healthy cubic metre of soil, it could be 25,000 kilometres of those microtubes going out, sourcing in all the nutrients. So we go and overgraze, plough, fertilise, you kill off the fungi. And so you've got drug addict plants waiting for their daily dose of NPK, etc. So it's, um, it's dramatic stuff. <coughs> and um, that's the equivalent. Um, of a truck ute, 25,000 kilometres, if you like, of, of those feeding tubes. And people that are upending the system in modern cropping are the, uh, the Haggerty's in Western Australia, up north, uh, east of Perth. Now, for those of us here, you'd be shocked how they farm because they're basically farming on beach sand. I feel like I should take along a beach umbrella and a beach ball when I go and visit them. Um, they've turned off all their industrial inputs. They're now using worm juice, with compost extract, and they're having the most remarkable results. And in a time when the Western Australian wheat belt's gone into huge debt, they've grown from 600 acres cropping to 30,000. Uh, but using animals is integral to their system uh, during the winter months. And that's by just working with biology, uh, even before those plants are shot out of the ground, the, the microbiology, the rhizosheaths of that fungi and other stuff is already starting to drive the whole system. And so that left hand photo is a photo uh, of them, Haggerty's on the right and the traditional neighbour on the left who industrial farms. This is just after harvest and that the guy on the left's country was already blowing as you can see. And if you think about soil biology, top right, harvest, November, 
that soil is now exposed to the sun 40, 45, 50 degrees for the whole summer. There's no soil biology survives that. What the Haggadis have done with grazing on top of the cropping system is agronomists said, no, no, we don't have the native grasses they've got in the east. But now they're starting to come. So they're now cropping into diverse perennial grasslands, which are constantly feeding that soil. So this is what the neighbour's paddock looks like. Not much biology on the, on the roots. A friend of mine's got a good microscope and he sent me these the other day. So very low soil aggregation, very few sticky hyphae from those fungi. That's what the Haggerty soil looks like, just next door, 50 metres away. And so it's a really healthy soil aggregation, sticky networks, glue holding it together. And I won't delay time, but a really healthy soil can nearly, is nearly composed of 50% airspace with good aggregations, which is where the water is stored, as well as with the biology. And it, it sort of um, seems a no-brainer until you made all the mistakes like me, and then they witness the change. So the question I'm asking is, um, what's next in recreating soil health? And I think what's happening now with people like Gabe Brown in, in the top of the prairies in the States, common size here, they're now discovering that if you put in 12, 13 different species in your cropping, uh, as, a, as a, a cover crop is building fertility for the next year's crop, if you put in that different number of species doing different things, you get this takeoff point of extraordinary performance under the soil. And some of the new thinking is, is, is now starting to explain what's going on. So, multi species pasture and cover cropping. And it depends where you are and what mixes you are, but you want different roots doing different things. You want legumes, you want brassicas, you want uh, things like barley and oats putting sugar in for your microhouse or fungi. And then you seem to get this takeoff. Um, and you can, if, if you graze it properly, you can then, as you can see in the background, come in and harvest the grain and still have all that green matter and that cover that can be put down. This is the guy that's really driving it, Gabe Brown, um, North Dakota. Uh, he, it's, he's putting the cover down with animals. Uh, like we can see there. And he has five principles of soil health. Try not to disturb the soil at all, limited disturbance. Putting down 100% of ground cover through animals, it can be through machinery. Huge diversity of plants and animals working in it, keeping your living roots as long as you can. Yes, and the integration of animals in the system and their, their dung and creating humates and, and helping that cover, nitrogen in, etc. And I'm not going to have the time, but uh, Colin Seiss, developer of pasture cropping, is now getting extraordinary results in uh, within two or three decades. Uh, the amount of carbon he's putting in the soil, holding a lot more water, uh, release of locked up phosphorus and other stuff, they're getting extraordinary readings across the spectrum. Because it's not like Australia's, Australia's microbiology is used to, to recycling rapidly scarce things like phosphorus. It's not like we've got to put a huge amount in there. Just encourage the processes under the ground to recycle it quickly through that dog-eat-dog -dog approach. And things like pH then start to self-correct, etc., etc. There's another good reason for not destroying your cover uh, through whatever, overgrazing or tillage. For example, splash erosion on bare soil can cause more compaction than tillage. Huge force in, in uh, raindrops. And this is a classic example of what Gay Brown's done in, uh, in less than 12 years. That's his soil underneath on that shovel. You can see worms, you can see aggregation, you can see the tilth and the colour. And that's 50 metres away across the fence, a traditional industrial farm. You can see how compacted uh, that is with no soil health. It's, it's dramatic and that's why a lot of our soils and the cropping zones are hitting the wall and that hard pan underneath. So what follows from that is extraordinary rainfall infiltration. So when he started in 91, he was getting about half an inch uh, infiltration in an hour. Had no soil aggregation. By 2009, 11 years of cover cropping, starting to get 10 inches an hour, just through simple soil 
absorption tests because he had some soil aggregation. And 2015, after 17 years of cover cropping, his first inch was disappearing in 9 seconds and his second inch in 16 seconds. So it's, it's, when you think about it, it's no-brainer stuff because we're always hanging out for that wonderful magic stuff called moisture. The other side of this, if we take the cover off our soil uh, at 41 degree air temperature, and we, you guys too, I think, in the last summer had a lot more than that. If you go just down half a centimetre, where the, the, the uh, heating up effect occurs, the soil temperature is 60 degrees, 60.6 centigrade. So no soil life is going to survive uh, that sort of situation. And I'll just quickly cover, we're now starting to get from science, this marriage of this takeoff from multi-species cover cropping and really well executed um, time grazing, holistic grazing. Um, and it's only been married in the last five or eight years. So mm -hmm. complex communities are the normal situation in nature. So our soils co-evolve to all work together and have great complexity. We simplify it through farming. So why do we think that underground the soil uh, should be any different to having a diverse ecosystem above it? And so therefore you ask the question why through overgrazing, uh, set stocking and, uh, and, and savage mechanical things do we upset this apple cart? And, and the key reason is that soil organic carbon coming from that, those root exudates, etc, etc, it's the key driver of our profitability both grazing and, profit, uh, and cropping. And to generate this high soil organic carbon, we need biologically rich soil, and you need animals grazing over it in both cropping and, and uh, broader grasslands. And it looks like this diverse multi-species stuff, getting to a critical number, is just having this takeoff extraordinary effect. And so you get to that, you get this self-organisation going on under the soil and you get a tipping point and you can make from light sandy soil to dark chocolate within two years is what's happening in the States. It's quite remarkable. I'm not going to get too technical on it, but um, the, the, the new research in microbiology is showing that two key things are happening. Once you get that, you've got your plants talking to the microbes, uh, cross-species communication. And that's going across the animal kingdom. So we've, if you eat healthy food off a healthy landscape with all its nutrients, and you have the right microbiology and biology in your gut, that's actually talking to us because it's switching on our genes and off. So you've got plants talking to microbes, and, and now we're involved in the scheme as well. And the common language is chemistry. It's not English or Latin, but it's hormones and things like that. So it's a bit mind-boggling when you put your head around it. And look, I don't want you to get hung up, but the scientists are calling it quorum sensing. Quorum as is, you need a minimum density before this tipping point occurs. And the communication then starts to occur initially between plants and microbes. I'll give you some examples in a minute. And then you get to this tipping point. So for example, in a healthy soil, if this plant realises that it's lacking nitrogen, it sends a message into the soil. And, um, a chemical message, in this case flavonoids, which is saying, oh, I'm lacking nitrogen. Bacteria pick that up, in this case. Um, rhizobia bacteria, and they start to form nodules, start grabbing nitrogen from the air and fix it for the plant. But you've got to have that trigger of that, um, what's called quorum sensing, that, that initial quorum thing to have this trigger. Another example is um, the plant has an infection, send signals into the soil, this time they're hormones, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria hormones. Uh, those bacteria respond and come in and target that disease, which could be a virus or another bacteria. It's quite remarkable once we trigger what nature has evolved to do. That's why these healthy systems are so extraordinary. And that's just a quick example. Um, you get to the right density uh, level on the left, uh, the plant gets attacked, and then uh, through those signalling messages, the attack um, bacterial virus come in. But what's really quite remarkable is that those bacteria or bugs are switching on and off plant genes. 
So there's communication at that level, what's called epigenetics. And I don't want you to get hung up, I just want you to get the picture on this. But quorum sensing really is a form of complex communication in the microorganisms through all these different chemical molecules, etc. And that coordinates group behaviours all working together, which means better adaptation to that situation. And that communication can be bacteria, fungi, plant microbe, humans, gut microbes. It's quite extraordinary to think that uh, without realising we're being communicated with. And so, yeah, cell-to-cell -cell communication, etc. So I asked the question, we're spraying the hell out of country, flogging the hell out of country, don't have that ground cover, don't have that soil biology, we've got no chance of this core of sense and communication activity being kicked into gear. And, and uh, that's the big cost of uh, not getting into a sort of more regenerative biological approach. And just because we're, we're here today with the reef catchment people, um, this has big implications, this regenerative cropping and grazing. You know, I would make the bold statement that if we all swung over those practices, the issue of, ne of nutrient runoff into the barrier reef is pretty well eliminated. These solutions require, rely, re uh, reside with we farmers, and that's incredibly exciting. <coughs> and the, and the, the best cane croppers and croppers now are starting to implement this stuff and eliminating nutrient runoff, as are the, the leading grazers. So key solutions to erosion and nutrient loss, obviously holistic grazing and, and cane cropping, we haven't got the time, but the leaders are doing, they're using um, things like biofertilisers, activating the soil biology, multi-species cover cropping, inter-road cropping, uh, no-till, minimum till, green manure and legumes and rotations. Uh, if they can't put um, cattle onto their country, they're crib rolling it, putting the cover down, and uh, cattle in those rotations. That, that's being refined, a lot of good soil biologists working with it, and, and, and it's changing rapidly. So really, regenerative ag offers solutions to this ongoing landscape degradation and nutrient drainage into the reef. And as I'll be touching on after lunch, the implications, because you can't have healthy nutrients in food unless you've got healthy soil biology bringing it back for your plants. So the implications for human health. Again, we farmers hold some of the best solutions to this exponential takeoff of the modern health crisis. Uh, just through restoring landscape function, absorbent soils, we know we, now we can crop without glyphosate, for example, which I'll touch on after lunch, and, and using biological inputs. So, that's a very quick skate across some big issues, but uh, hopefully it'll set up the rest of the day. I'm not too sure how our time's going there. Five minutes, okay. Um, so I'll just leave you with this quote from uh, what I think is, Wendell Berry I regard as the really great father of modern regenerative agriculture. He's been writing since the 60s, very consistently about uh, what farming communities uh, that we shouldn't be getting too huge, but also particularly that we should be ecological. And, and he said this way back in 95. We need to make our farming practices and our food economy subject to standards not set by the industrial system, but by the health of the ecosystems themselves and of human communities. So I'll just leave that up there for us to ponder over uh, a cup of tea and maybe we've got some Bundaberg rum being brought in. But um, we've probably got time then, Julia, for some questions, if anyone wants to throw them. That's a yeah. part of the idea. Sorry. I was very eagerly taking notes because um, I really enjoyed your talk and um, I'm sure you all did as well. And I really um, like hearing about the quorum sensing. I know some of you local um, producers have started talking about it and I think it's coming back to what the message we always say is um, that nature didn't work. You know, the more diverse you have, diversity you have in your soils, um, the whole system is working in there, similar to your gut, gut biome, so that's a similar thing with big soils, so it's alive and we want to keep it alive and, um, and encourage those communication networks and to do the job really. So yeah, thank you very much for touching on it and I encourage you to look up quorum sensing and um, research a little bit more. Um, have we got any questions in the room for Charlie? Are we all very overwhelmed? 
with his presentation. You've done a great job. We've got the time over cut the Yes, coffee. that's a lot of points. Yeah. Well, if we don't have questions, maybe we have a good question? Maybe we go into that Gina video and do it. Go on, It's not really a question, it's more related to the diversity of the cover crops and then the diversity, obviously, is the same in a Um, yeah, so how much diversity are we chasing in our, in our grazing system, do you think? Yeah, great question. Uh, I know from talking to some of the plant scientists in the States, some of the, uh, both the short and the long grass prairies had up to 700 species when they first came in. Uh, in Australia, it's certainly hundreds. I don't know we've counted that many. So, and they're all doing different things from legumes to deep roots to forbs to uh, C3, C4 grasses, um, the summer active and your winter active. So I, I think a basic rule of thumb is the more diversity, the better is the secret. And uh, on our basalt country at home, through um, ecological grazing, we're now starting to get species appearing uh, that we hadn't seen before. And uh, I don't think we've got any idea. And that Western Australian example is mind blowing and they haven't seen uh, feminist kangaroo grasses and those things, um, probably since the 1840s or something, and, and the, the critters, as, as the soil gets deep and active, are bringing up the seed and whatever. So, but yeah, diversity, diversity, diversity is a key secret. Yeah. So, Thank you. So, you're saying that, I, I, you know, grazing situation like that. You look at a paddock of pasture and there might be three or four different pastures there, even if you see a, a weed of some sort, you think, oh, I better go and dig that out or spray it. Um, should you be embracing di di biodiversity uh, at the expense of having what you consider undesirable weeds? Like, we, we ride around on a motorbike with a hose stuck on it, and if you see a slight thistle, for instance, it's up in the hills, you'll, you'll dig it out, but we be leaving them. Now, that's a really good question. Um, the exception I would talk about would be what we have problems with down south, which are your perennial grass weeds, which are very aggressive. But usually your thistles and other, a lot of the weeds are deep-rooted forbs, and it's nature's way of trying to correct either, in the case of thistles, too much nitrogen, which they're good at taking out of the system, or getting through compaction to open up the ground. So in many ways, obviously there's, you could be careful of which species, but usually the weeds are there as an interim thing trying to get the ecosystem function going again, correcting what's happened before. And uh, I mean, that's why you see so many thistles up on a sheep camp because of the nitrogen and that sort of stuff. So let them do their job, um, but hopefully with ecological grazing, you're putting nitrogen more evenly across your paddock. But uh, usually, yeah, we've demonised weeds, and some of them deserve it. So, you know, there's some ones that you don't want to let that get going. But um, by and large, they're nature's way of trying to restore function. And I, I'm, I've noticed at home, once we started to get ecological grazing going, because uh, I remember we planted, I, I guess, we, all that granite country was over cleared. Uh, we once, it was once grassy woodland. And uh, we used to get wiped out every five to eight years. My father said ever since the 20s um, by wingless grasshoppers. <coughs> and so we realised we had to get some function back into this light granite country. So we, in the last six, seven years, we put in about 50,000 local native trees and shrubs and the, um, uh, the native flowers and stuff. So we've got parasitic wasps and birds and, and plus ground cover, um, which means that there's more moisture in the soil and the nematodes attack the uh, egg beds. We've had no wingless grasshopper attack since the, uh, since the 80s.